All right. Hey, everybody. Hope you had a fantastic Memorial Day. Uh, I know that I've been keeping pretty busy. I think it's kind of funny looking at myself right now. I look like a monk who went on vacation and his hair started growing back in. Anyway, uh, for today, I'm up in my hat game. And uh, this is my hat for today. It's a construction hat from Waste Management. I have no idea where this comes from because the guy I'm borrowing this from never worked for Waste Management. So anyway, it's a real helmet with the cushy stuff and the warning that says you can still die even if you're wearing this hat. So how do I look? All right. Uh, so let's get to our introduction. So uh, first up in life skills, we're talking about, uh, you know, making and remaking your identity for high school, which is kind of cool. Uh, next up uh, for the current events and economics, you have a short essay question. We'll talk about that later. Uh, in history, we are being introduced and we're talking about the progressives, which are pretty cool. Uh, in literature, we're going on to, uh, we're reviewing chapter 27 and homework is chapter 28, yeah. In science, you have a couple quick questions to answer there, which is kind of nice. Uh, in math group number one, we are doing a lesson over probability between dependent and independent events and how those are different, okay? And then uh, finally, in math group two, we are doing uh, more exponent stuff. And today, I love the lesson because it sounds really complicated, but it is so easy. You can look so smart when you do it right. So looking forward to that. All right, guys, let's go ahead and jump in with our life skills. All right, I think I'm good. <clears throat> okay, so today for life skills, not really talking about any like deep personal thing or anything like that. I just want to take a minute and uh, mention how cool it is that you're going to high school for you eighth graders and you're going to have the ability to remake yourself completely. Um, I remember my middle school, I think I mentioned this before, they were like a super conservative, very religious, to very racist school. And, uh, and so I made a lot of waves there and I got smacked down pretty hard by the teachers and whatnot. Uh, cause you know, I was like, racism isn't cool guys. You shouldn't do that. Um, and, and things like that. And so by the time I got to high school, I was really tired. And in fact, when I went to high school, I went from this, the school I was at, the, the, the private school for middle school is kind of smaller, kind of like Da Vinci, right? Um, you know, I think um, in the school, there was maybe between 100 and 200 kids. And I went from that small school environment to a school uh, that had over 3,000 kids. And so as, as, as I was transitioning, I kind of purposed it in myself that uh, I would remake my personality. I would remake my image because pretty much no one there knew me. Uh, and it worked. Um, I wanted to be a more quiet kind of guy who just kind of laid back in the cut. Not the kind of guy who made a lot of noise and caused a lot of problems for himself. You know, um, that's who I wanted to be. And that transitional period was the opportunity for me to become that person. And so this is your transitional opportunity. Between now and August, you can decide who you want to be, and then you can just be that person without having the baggage and the weight of a reputation that's following you. Because when you go to this school uh, coming up here uh, in August, eighth graders, and you're a freshman, you're a ninth grader, no one's going to know who you are or who you have been, and, and no one's going to have any preconceived ideas about you. It's perfect. So again, this is your opportunity to reinvent yourself, to make yourself out to be whoever you want to be. You just have to follow through and become that person. All right, let's go ahead and go on to our current events. Oh no, Yon's coming in. Ooh, okay, shake it off. Shake it off, shake it off. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry you had to see that. Um, all right, let's go ahead and jump into current events economics. So, I really enjoyed talking about space with you guys because space is really cool. Um, and uh, But we do have to finish out the year talking about some economics. So I wanted to wrap up the Artemis talk with a short essay uh, question. And so I want at least one paragraph from you. You can type it out, 
you can handwrite it and then send me a photo whatever you want to do uh, but I need your um, I need your uh, um, one paragraph or more essay to be about the Artemis program and the Apollo program so what are the differences in 2024 the things that have changed from the 1960s and 1970s um, some of the differences that you could mention are the kinds of people who are going I'm not going to say exactly what but the people who are going are a little different you got to tell me how um, the amount of time they're going for is very different the purpose of their mission is very different all that kind of stuff and so I need at least one paragraph about how the Artemis missions are different than the Apollo missions were. Uh, and so please go ahead and write that and send that in. Uh, also, if you're interested in the Artemis missions, I want to know about that, you know? Uh, the Artemis missions represent um, a new frontier in uh, American space exploration. And uh, it is actually a very serious field uh, for, uh, for jobs that you could go into. Um, I know a couple people who uh, have gotten jobs at NASA, and I know a bunch of people who've gotten jobs at NASA contractors. Um, uh, different places like the, uh, the we have in town here in Tucson, like the Planetary Science Institute, uh, they employ, uh, I think, uh, near, near 100 people. Uh, to do planetary science uh, missions like OSIRIS-REx with NASA, different exploratory, uh, exploratory things. Um, you know, I have some friends who uh, have left and, and worked for NASA proper, either in California or in Florida. Um, but yeah, it's a big business. Um, and so, you know, maybe this could be an exciting career field for you in the future. Um, but if, if you're at all interested about it, I'd like to know. You should include that in your essay. So please write your essay, one paragraph or more, about how the 1960s and 70s Apollo missions are different or were different than the current uh, Artemis program is. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get to uh, your main U.S. history. All right, so it's time for U.S. history. So today we're talking about progressives. Now, we've talked many times in the past about people who were progressive, who were fighting for more rights for the little guy. Uh, we talked at great length uh, about factories and how the Industrial Revolution changed things where you could mass produce a lot of stuff. And so people were able to buy more stuff for a lot less but for the people who worked in the factories, it was kind of a bum deal. And uh, we also talked about how uh, a lot of companies like to hire women to hang out in the factories and, and do stuff there because they were cheaper and uh, how you could lose limbs and stuff like that. And so we talked quite a bit about people who tried to make the world in America specifically better by uh, uh, making uh, the lives of normal people better. The progressives were, were the same kind of people, except they were much more so. And so the, um, the, the conditions in America had grown steadily worse and worse, despite everyone's best efforts, from the Industrial Revolution all the way up until the 1900s. Things kept on getting worse and worse and worse. Um, there was a famous book about the meat packing industry called the jungle and it was disgusting and it was an incredibly strong and influential book that woke America up to some of the really bad conditions in the meat packing industry specifically because although it was a fictional book it was kind of like historical fiction where the author of the book actually went through and lived in a meat packing district in I think it was either New York or Chicago and he lived there for uh, something like a, a year as he was writing the story and so he included things that really happened in his book and again super gross like uh, meat would fall on the ground and uh, people would just pick it up and throw it back into 
the, the packing meats, uh, there's blood everywhere. Sometimes what they would do is they would take spoiled meat and they would grind it up with fresh meat. And so they would kind of hide the, uh, the, the, the spoiled rotten, you know, meats. People would lose like a finger or something like that and it would fall into like the ground beef and they would just keep on grinding, you know? And so like gross, right? And so uh, things were also really bad at factories because the regulations were so lax that people would start to put together things like garment factories in their apartment. And so what they would do is they would find like immigrants who just came over from like, I don't know, like Slovakia or something like that, where they didn't speak any English whatsoever. They would take them. They would throw them in a ratty little apartment, usually like a family of like four, five, six, seven people, like a parent, all their kids, you know. Um, and, and they would keep these immigrants who didn't speak English in these dank small apartments and they would force them to work for really poor wages. And so uh, these families would sometimes be locked in these apartments for months at a time without being able to go outside because they lived in literally the same room where they'd be working in all day long. And so when it was time to, to, uh, to go to sleep, you know, they would only leave the room to go to the bathroom, uh, and then they'd have their food brought to them, and then they'd sleep on the floor in the same room that they'd been working all day. And, and again, this was becoming more and more common. And so the progressives uh, were out there to change things. They, 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 they very rightly said, Things don't need to be this way in America. We can make things better and we can still have cool stuff and factories and meat and things like that. Uh, and so the progressives were a great group of people who changed these things. We don't have these things today largely because of the progressive movement in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So today you're going to be watching a video that talks more about the specifics and that doesn't just tell you a bunch of gross stories like I do. Um, and then they uh, have a, um, uh, a thing for you to read. And so we're going to go through both of those today. And then tomorrow, again, we get to talk about, again, one of my favorite presidents, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, because Mr. Roosevelt was a progressive. Okay, all right, let's get to it. All right, so we are reading chapter, or we just read chapter 27. And um, in chapter 27, uh, Tom Sawyer wakes up in the morning after that crazy night with uh, Joe and that other weirdo um, where, where they, they found all that treasure. And, um, and he's, he, at first he thinks that it might have been just a, another dream. And so he meets up with Huck, and Huck, he assures him that, no, it was definitely not a dream. It was all for real. And so uh, Huck and Tom start talking about where they think the treasure might be. And so they remember that there was a uh, number two involved, like a, a place number two. And so um, what they do is they decide to check out the two taverns in town. Now, um, it's important to note that historically, uh, like a, a bar or a tavern uh, was a place where people, of course, would congregate and drink and, you know, do things like play darts or, 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 or you know, tell stories, things like that. They'd get together at these places. Um, taverns also usually served food, uh, just like a bar and grill today. But something that taverns don't do anymore that they did do back then was taverns were also places that functioned as hotels. And so inside the one uh, tavern, you would have everything from, you know, a restaurant to a bar to a, a hotel or a motel. And so taverns back then functioned as all of those things. And so somebody who was traveling on the road uh, would stop into a town and they would just visit the local tavern where they'd find everything they needed. Uh, you know, everything from food, entertainment, and even a place to sleep. And so they wanted to check out the two taverns to find out if maybe uh, the two referred to room number two in one of the taverns. And so in the first tavern, they find out that, you know, someone's there and he's not suspicious. 
And in the second tavern, uh, I think it was the kiddo who, <laughs> whose dad or something like that runs the tavern, told them that nobody goes in or out of room number two. It's always locked, except for at night. And so ding, 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 that, that seems like the winner. That's the tavern that might have the room where they're looking, uh, or, or with the treasure, right? Uh, and they decide, too, if they find Joe, they're going to tail him so that they can you know, make sure that they're right and they're not wasting their time at this room number two. Um, something to kind of note is that, um, you know, Mark Twain, uh, the guy who wrote this book, he was famous for making fun of things that people treasured. You know, he made fun of church. Uh, he made fun of school. Uh, you know, you've already read it. Uh, he kind of made fun of, of funerals, you know, with, uh, with, with the funeral where the boys come in, surprise, we're alive, you know? Uh, and so um, in this, he is making fun of the temperance movement. And so the temperance movement was a movement uh, that was, uh, it was, it was um, co-ed, but it was, truth be told, back then it was mostly women uh, who were against drinking alcohol. Uh, and so the temperance movement uh, was this very powerful movement that eventually led to the prohibition of all alcohol. Uh, but at this point in time, it was just kind of like a social movement. And so they introduced something called the Temperance Tavern. And the Temperance Tavern was supposedly like a, a bar and grill and inn or, or hotel that didn't serve alcohol. Uh, they, they just served like juice or whatever, you know. Uh, but even the Temperance Tavern has a secret room in the back where they where they serve you know like bourbon and gin and stuff like that. And so so even even the Temperance Tavern has uh, alcohol uh, in the tavern. <laughs> Again, he's teasing the Temperance Movement because many of the leaders of the Temperance Movement were uh, well known for uh, having having their own private collections of wine and beer and things like that. Uh, so anyway, that was it for this chapter. Um, uh, you'll have to read the next chapter to find out what happens next. And so the next chapter, I believe, wait, was this 28? Yeah, this was chapter uh, 27. So the next chapter is going to be 28. Again, make sure you get your words five times each and your dictionary definitions, and you should be good to go. All right, folks, for science, it's very easy. You got a couple questions to do. Uh, so I also want to mention that this uh, lesson on basic machines is the last uh, kind of group of lessons that we're doing in science for the year. Uh, this is our last week of graded work. And so we're going to be doing these basic questions, and then we're going to be doing a quick review of the whole chapter. Uh, and then we have one final set of questions that we're going to be going over uh, day three, four, and five. Um, and so answer these three easy questions that are on the website and get those turned in. And then for the rest of this week, we are going to merely be reviewing uh, the, 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 the chapter that was, uh, because it is too late to jump into something totally new. All right, so let's go ahead and get that done, and let's jump into math. Good. All right, my math group one kiddos, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Where is my trackpad? There it is. Oh, no. Ah, trackpad, you messed me up. Where are we at here? Nope. There we go. So today we're talking about the uh, uh, probability of uh, independent and dependent events. So... Um, if let's say that um, let's say that your teacher had a hat, and inside the hat was uh, everyone's names on a little slip of paper, right? And so every day, let's say when the teacher was getting ready to ask a question, the teacher would ask a question and then pull a random name out of the hat, read the name off of the paper, and then that person would have to answer. Got it? I've seen teachers do this in the past. Okay, they. They just have everyone's name on a slip and they just reach in and they grab it. So everybody always has to be paying attention because you never know when your name is going to be grabbed. Okay? Um, if the teacher grabs a name out of a hat and puts the name back in, then we call that an independent event. All right? And so if you are in the class, let's say there's 10 kids in the class and you are the 11th kid. No, let's say there's 10 kids in the class and you're one of them. Okay? So... Uh, there's a 1 in 10 chance that your name is going to get called every time if the teacher puts the name back in the hat when they're done. That's an independent event. Uh, a question from this morning has nothing to do with the question that's asked this afternoon. They're independent of each other. There's always a 1 in 10 chance. 
Now, think of it this way. What if every time the teacher pulls the name out of the hat, then they throw the name away? Then the number of names in the hat goes down and down and down. So, if your name is in the hat, and the teacher reaches in and calls out one of your friends, and they throw it away, guess what? That time, you had a 1 in 10 chance of being called, but the next time, you have a 1 in 9 chance of being called. Because the second time is dependent upon the first time. The second time, the number of possibilities went down because that choice was thrown out. And so that's a super basic example of probabilities between independent and dependent uh, events. Uh, if one event has nothing to do with the other event, no effect on it, then it's independent. If one event has an effect on the other event, then it's dependent. They depend on each other. So let's go ahead and start reading what the book has to say about this, okay? Uh, Raji and Kara uh, must each choose a topic from a list of topics to research for the class. If Raji's choice has no effect on Kara's choice and vice versa, the events are independent. For independent events, the occurrence of one event has no effect on the probability that a second event will occur. If once Raj chooses a topic, Kara must choose from the remaining topics, then the events are dependent. For dependent events, the occurrence of one event does have an effect on the probability that a second event will occur. So again, if, I don't know who these kids are, but, but if whoever Raji is, uh, chooses something, and once he chooses it, or she, I don't know if Raj is a boy or a girl, if that student chooses that topic, okay, and then no one else can choose it, Raji's choice has an effect on Kara's choice, because Kara can now lo no longer choose that topic that Ravi chose. Yeah? So determining whether events are independent or dependent. Decide whether each set of events is independent or dependent, and explain your answer. So, First, Erica rolls a three on one number cube of dice. <laughs> Why do they call it number cubes? Every day. Erica rolls a three on a dice and a two on another dice. Since the outcome of rolling one number, since the outcome of rolling one dice does not affect the outcome of rolling a second dice, the events are independent. So rolling one dice has no bearing on rolling another dice. They're completely separate, completely independent. So, uh, B, uh, Tomoko chooses a 7th grader from her team, <clears throat> from a group of 7th and 8th graders, and then Juan chooses a different 7th grader from the remaining students. Since Juan cannot pick the same student that Tomoko picked, and since there are fewer students for Juan to choose from after Tomoko chooses, the events are dependent. Again, because Tomoko chose that person, and so Juan can't choose them. So they're dependent. To find the probability that two independent events will happen, multiply the probabilities of the two events. So, uh, again, it's going back to like the rolling of the dice, okay? So, if you want to know the probability that uh, a dice roll uh, will be two, and, and that you'll roll a two twice, then you have to take the probability of rolling a two once, which is one over six, and the probability of rolling a two a second time, which is another one over six, and then multiply them. So 1 6 times 1 6 equals 1 over 36. So you have a 1 in 36 chance of rolling two twos in a row. Got it? And so those are independent events, and so we just have to multiply the probabilities of both events. So they do this fancy pants math way of doing it. Probability of two independent events. So P, A, and B, probability of both events, equals P, A, probability of the first event, times P, B probability of the second event. Or a delicious sandwich. Okay, uh, next up. Finding the probability of independent events. Find the probability of flipping a coin and getting heads and then rolling a six on a dice numbered one through six. The outcome of flipping the coin does not affect the outcome of rolling the dice. So the events are independent. So you take uh, one half times one six and you get one twelfth. Uh, so you have a 1 in 12 chance of getting a heads and a 6 on the same roll and flip. <laughs> to find the probability of two dependent events, you must determine the effect that the first event has on the probability of the second event. Um, so if there is an effect, you have to figure out what that effect is first. 
So probability of two events. So we have a fancy uh, probability of A and B is uh, P times A times P uh, B after A. Now, yeah, that's not super mathy in the way that they describe it, but let, let's talk about it, okay? So um, let me um, let me go ahead and switch over to the iPad for a second, okay? Hey everybody, we're back and with an iPad. So uh, let's talk about that example that we had in the very beginning of the teacher pulling the names out of the hat. All right. So if there is a um, let's say that the teacher pulling the name out of the hat, uh, what is the chance that you will not be selected? Okay. Chance you will not be selected. So there is a 9 out of 10 chance, 9 out of 10 chance that you will not be selected the first time because 9 students are not you <laughs> and 10 students are total. You got it? So again, the probability that a student that is not you that's going to be picked is 9 out of 10 on the first draw. So what is the probability? Uh, chances that you won't be chosen twice. Chance that you won't be picked twice. So on the first on the first pick, it's nine out of ten. So there's a nine out of ten chance that you will not be picked in the first go around. But if we're throwing the name away after we pick that name, okay, the next go around, it's not 9 over 10. In fact, in the next go around, only 9 names are in the hat, and only 8 of them are not you. So on the next go around, there is an 8 out of 9 chance that you will not be picked. You see? Now, in order to figure out what the probability is that you will not be picked twice, we have to multiply the 9 over 10 times the 8 over 9. So, 9 times 8 is 72 over 90. Okay, and of course, you know, you can reduce that, as all good math students should. Let me get 36, and uh, let's see here. Uh, you can reduce that further by 3 which will give you 12 over, what is that, 15? And again, by another 3, which will give you what? Is that 4? Yeah, 3 times 4 is 12. Yeah, over 5. So there's a 4 fifths chance that you will not be chosen twice under the way this works. You understand? So you have to figure out the odds of the first thing happening, and then you have to figure out the odds of the second thing happening given that the first thing happens. And then that's how you uh, figure out all of it. That's how you figure out what the probability is. All right, folks, we're gonna finish out today's lesson with this last example, okay? All right, so Micah has five $1 bills, three $10 bills, and two $20 bills in her wallet. If she picks two bills at random, what is the probability of her picking the two $20 bills? So the first draw changes the number of bills left and may change the number of $20 bills left. Excuse me. Uh, so the events are dependent. So her first draw, okay, so she has five $1 bills, so that's five bills, three $10 bills, and two $20 bills. That's 10 bills total, yeah? And two of them are 20s. So in the first draw, she is gonna do two draws and she wants to get both of the 20s. So in the first draw, she has a two out of 10 chance of getting it right there, two out of 10 which reduces to one out of five, okay? So the first chance that she draws a $20 bills is a one out of five chance. The second time that she draws, we no longer have 10 bills in there because she already drew one. So now we have nine bills, okay? And since she drew one of the 20s at, on the first go, now there's only one 20 left in there. And so there's a one out of nine chance that she, the second bill she picks will be the 20. And so it changes to one out of nine. 
And so in order to figure out the absolute probability of both of these events happening at the same time, we have to take 1 fifth multiplied by 1 over 9. That gives us 1 over 45. So she has a 1 out of 45 chance of just randomly reaching into her pocket and pulling one bill out after another and having them both be 20s. You got it? Okay, that's it for today's lesson. Um, you don't have any homework. You just need to make sure that you understood what we just talked about. Okay? All right, have a great one, group number one. I will see you tomorrow. All right, group number two, let's get to your lesson. So I like this lesson because it's super duper easy and you can feel super duper smart when you do it, okay? So let's say that we have, um, let's take an L for Lucy. Do, 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 Lucy. Okay, L for Lucy. And so we'll have um, L to the negative fifth power times L to the eighth power. What does that equal? L to the negative fifth times L to the eighth. Well, guess what? It equals L to the third. Boom, just like that. Drop the mic, walk away. You're a genius. Wow, how smart are you? And so, if you're like, Mr. Roll, I have no idea how this works. Well, I just took negative five and I added it to eight. <laughs> and I got three, okay? So when I combine these two, I get that. Done, it's that easy. If you're like, Mr. Roll, I don't understand the mechanics of how that works, though. Let's review the mechanics together. So, L to the negative fifth power times L to the eighth power. If I have to represent these in another way, I can represent L to the negative fifth power as 1 over L times L times L times L times L, just like that. And I can represent L to the eighth power. Oh, man, I'm going to have to write this all out now. Like this. L gets 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oops, I don't need that last dot. Okay, we get the idea. Okay, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 L's. Okay, and so L to the negative fifth, L to the eighth. When these two crazy things combine, they give us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Is that eight, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? One, two, three, four, five, like that. And then I'm gonna switch colors like this, and we're gonna cancel them out. This L cancels this L, 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 this L cancels this L. Oh my goodness, look at all these L's that we have left. Oh wow, well, we have L to the third left, because we have L times L times L. That easy okay and so right here I could just look at it and be like that was L to the third oh wow is it 2 16 a.m. holy cow you guys know what time it is all right uh, anyway so that's how we figure out how many L's are left mr. roll needs to get this video published so I can go to sleep all right guys you have a Khan Academy lesson that talks about what I just did with you but in much longer form Believe it or not, sometimes I can be not the most long-winded person in education. And, uh, and then you need to do a practice quiz over this. Okay? All right. Uh, miss you guys. I will see you tomorrow. Take care.